Because you listen to this show, I'm going to assume that, like me, you're a person who's fascinated by scientific and philosophical questions. So I wanted to tell you about another show I've discovered recently, the addictive, eye-opening, mind-bending podcast series, The End of the World with Josh Clark. Josh Clark is co-host of the absorbing Stuff You Should Know podcast. And for The End of the World, he dives into existential risks, ways we humans might accidentally wipe ourselves out with the same technology we're developing now in the hope that it will make a bright future for us. For example, how a haphazard physics experiment could end the universe, or why artificial intelligence could take control of the world, or how an artificially mutated virus could escape a lab and create a global pandemic. This is serious stuff for sure, but the end of the world delivers the fascinating science behind existential risks through an immersive experience with a beautiful original score and cinematic sound design that takes you from a spacecraft trying to navigate interstellar space to deep inside your body to the far future where humans have evolved into a post-biological species who live in digital form. The End of the World with Josh Clark is waiting to take you on an adventure. You can find it on Apple Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, or wherever you get your podcasts. Why not listen to all 10 episodes now and join the conversation on social media with hashtag EOTW Josh Clark. Welcome to Future Makers, your invitation to cutting edge debates on our changing society with leading researchers at the University of Oxford. Our first series is all about artificial intelligence. I'm Peter Millikan, Professor of Philosophy. Thank you for joining me here in the Thomas Hobbes Room at Hartford College for the final episode in our first series of Future Makers. Today we'll kick off by looking back at the themes we've discussed so far and forward into the likely development of AI in the future. We'll be joined by Professor Gil McVean to hear how big data is transforming healthcare by Dr. Sandra Wachter, who'll discuss the need for a legal framework around AI. And I'll also be talking with Professor Sir Nigel Shadbolt on where the field of artificial intelligence research has come from and where it's going. Lastly, I'll be sharing some of my views on where humanity is heading with AI. And you'll also hear from my final guest, Azim Azar, host of the Exponential View podcast. In episode four, we heard about the transformative effect that AI is having on the healthcare sector. Since then, I've been keen to learn more about the impact of big data. So recently, I caught up with Professor Gil McVean, director of Oxford's Big Data Institute, to hear more. Welcome, Gil. Thanks for having me. Could you begin by taking us through some examples of how big data is going to transform the healthcare sector in the short, medium and longer term? Artificial intelligence is essentially the combination of data, industrially scaled data collection, with the combination of algorithms that can peer into those data and identify patterns that the human eye or human brain isn't good at spotting easily. These algorithms are incredibly general purpose and they can be directed towards any type of problem. The places they're going to make a difference in healthcare are the places where there is that combination of industrial data collection with a real need for some kind of improvement. In the short term, I think a lot of that is to do with simply improving the processes and the workflows by which patients are seen and prescriptions given and hospitals are organised because these are huge logistical challenges, essentially. And it's an area where AI is incredibly useful and has been being used in, say, the logistics industry already. So as a way of just improving workflows and processes, it's already made quite a big impact. Are we talking about workflows which enable the collection of data, say, about treatments and about outcomes or something else? We're talking about very simple things like where patients are in a hospital, which treatments they've had, whether they've had particular tests done, whether those tests have been done, whether someone has vital signs which mean they need to go and be seen now, even down to things like scheduling operations and making sure you're using equipment and facilities 
as efficiently as possible. Now, are you talking about bringing benefit to those particular patients or are you talking about collecting reliable data which can then inform the treatment of future patients or is it both? Patients will definitely benefit from this kind of work, but they'll benefit because the hospital's more efficient and doctors are getting the information that they need in a timely fashion. So they'll benefit by existing processes being applied at the greatest efficiency. In addition, it is also collecting a lot of information that can be mined in the future to try and improve treatment and to spot why some people, for example, fare well for a particular treatment and others do badly. But primarily, and in the, the near future, it's really just going to be used to increase the efficiency with which existing functions can be delivered. Right, OK. So there's an immediate gain from just making things more efficient without necessarily learning anything from clever algorithms. But then, as a byproduct of that, we can collect loads of data, which in the medium term is going to feed back into research and hence into treatment. That's exactly where the world is going, I think, is that the key change here is to do with the speed and volume with which data can be captured and processed. So what I'm talking about so far has been just very regular hospital data, for example, or prescribing data or things like that. But what we're increasingly seeing is uh, growth in technologies around imaging, for example, or genomics, where the ability to peer into an individual's biological state or health state is incredibly accurate and it's increasing in terms of its resolution. Those data allow you to make good decisions today, but also they provide incredibly rich source of information that can be mined in a systematic way if you can get the data right and all the correct metadata and all the consent and so on for understanding structure and for making new diagnosis or speeding diagnosis or getting the right grading, for example, in a pathology setting. Are there cases where that sort of thing is already making a big impact on treatment? I think today there are a few places where the high throughput collection of data is already making a difference. The ones I'd particularly point to are around imaging, which is probably where artificial intelligence has been the most powerful. In... So this is identifying cancers and things yes, like that? Yes, exactly. It? So peering into radiology uh, screens or digital pathology, places where uh, you are essentially doing something visual and you're looking for some pattern in that. And on the basis of what you observe, you're trying to decide what type of disease someone has, how to treat them, what the likely prognosis is. Now, today, that's typically done with a human looking at it and making a decision and putting a number against it and saying, I think you're going to get X. What that person doesn't have is the huge experience that a computer can have out of looking and storing information about thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions of images. So in radiology, this is already being used. In digital pathology, say cancer grading, it's not quite at the stage of being used, but it's really very close. And I take it it's not just that it can handle so many so quickly, but it enables the images that are sort of most problematic to be given to the human to check where the routine ones just go through. I think that's absolutely right. It's about sifting and bringing up to the top the things that need additional input. So I think there is an element in which it's sort of replacing humans, for example, in the grading world, we know that in almost any medical discipline, there is huge inter-rate of variability. So different people look at the same image and come to different conclusions. Or the same person looks at the same image, but with a period of time in between, and they make a different conclusion. That thing is well documented. So when you give a computer the same image at different times, it tends to make the same decision, and it massively reduces that variability. There are no places where decision making is changing or being replaced entirely by the computer, but there are plenty of places where the prioritization of these images is being automated and then those highly prioritized images are being put in front of the doctor, for example, saying, we think this is what's happening here, give it a tick or don't give it a tick.
Is there a chance that different algorithms might come up with different judgments, just like different humans do? I mean, if you train your algorithm on a, a different initial set of data, it might end up latching on to slightly different features. That's certainly true. And clearly one of the major worries about the use of computers to make decisions is that they will learn about what they see in the data in front of them. They don't know about the data that's not in front of them. If you try and translate what you learnt in Hospital A to Hospital B, where something is slightly different, then you can get problems. So that puts a real premium on good data collection, good validation, good replication, good regulation practice all around what it means to have a successful algorithm or an algorithm that is ready to be used in a clinical setting. And I suppose one great advantage of an algorithm over a human is that if it does make errors, at least it's consistent in those kinds of errors. So assessing how well it's doing, that can feed back pretty reliably into improving future performance. That's certainly true. So computers are very good if you train the code appropriately at learning. And that means using recent experience to improve the knowledge that they already have. And so there's a a lot of work about how you essentially bootstrap previous knowledge with a new observation and then you can obviously end up changing what you believe about things that you've seen before on the basis of new information. That's perfectly acceptable and built into the way in which these algorithms work. But fundamentally, given the same training data and the same reward functions, the computer will come to the same set of conclusions. So that's radiology and imaging we've been talking about there. I mean, what other areas do you see having a, a relatively high impact either very soon or in the near future? I think it's almost any area of healthcare will be impacted by artificial intelligence within a really short space of time. Meaning what? So I'll, get, I'll give you some examples. Yeah. Uh, so I work in genomics where we sequence the genomes of lots of people. And in those genomes, we try and pick out things that we think are relevant to the disease or we try and understand the disease process. For a long time, we've been trying to develop algorithms that say, oh, here's the bit that's important. Quite recently, the field has started experimenting with artificial intelligence as a way of essentially replacing that very much expert-driven view. Guess which does better? Um, the algorithms just do better than the human because... Even chosen human experts. Yes, because when the expert comes to look at uh, the genome data, typically they come with a load of preconceptions about what something should look like. Whereas uh, the computer doesn't do that, you can draw on the wisdom of the masses, training it with lots of examples that lots of different people can provide it, not just one expert, but lots and lots of different experts. And that it can capture that information and transfer it in, in very sensible and rapid ways to new experiments. So that's just technology, essentially. That's just improving how we sequence the genome and pull out the things that we think are relevant. Which particular areas of healthcare are we talking about that impacting most on? Where does knowledge of the genome make a big difference? It's primarily useful in two places. One is in cancer prognosis and treatment, where the different mutations that people can have in their genome mean that different drugs will be useful or mean that they might have a good survival chance or a low survival chance. The other place it's incredibly helpful is in rare disease, where there are families, for example, where there's a rare developmental condition. You might sequence the genome of the affected people in their family to try and work out which bit of the DNA has gone wrong. And there you need a combination of the clinician, but augmented by the wisdom of the machine. That actually brings us to a related issue and the, the issue of bias. I mean, presumably one great advantage of using artificial intelligence here is that a clinician who may have no experience at all of various rare and exotic diseases that maybe a very, you know, infrequent in Britain, can actually use a, a machine that's been trained with information from an appropriate population. Is that the case? Computers are excellent at combining information from very many different sources and, and using that to make decisions. The decisions they make are only as good as the data that they're fed and the training information that they're given. When it comes to making decisions, we know that every source of information is biased and every decision is wrong at some level. But the idea is if you can collect a huge amount of 
information and a huge amount of decisions, then you try and eliminate a lot of that noise so that you're combining the experience of, of lots and lots of observations. You're really getting the statistical power to see what's real versus what's not real. There will be bias because the decisions people have made in the past will have been dependent on their the knowledge. The data that you collect is never free from subtle biases about how you recruit patients, for example. If we look at developmental disease study in the UK, it's strongly biased to certain parts of people's ancestry because of where the disease comes from. So there are all these biases, but it doesn't mean to say you can't use those data to make good decisions because the numbers help. There's two distinct sources of bias there by the sound of it. I mean, one of them is to do with the people who have been observed and they might be predominantly for example of one racial group or one particular part of the world or the country and then the other is that insofar as the information is informed by decisions of clinicians from the past they may have been blinkered or biased in one way or another is is that right yes exactly but that's where the idea of the iterative learning comes if you train an algorithm in a rather naive way, just saying all the decisions the clinicians previously made were right, and I don't believe that there's any bias in these data, then you're only going to carry on those bad decisions. However, if you can take the data that was collected historically, and you can do two things, you can first of all augment it with what actually happened to these individuals. So outcome, did they respond well to this treatment? How long did they live? And secondly, you acknowledge and you identify and you measure the types of bias in your data. So for example, most of the people who are studied in terms of their genetics are white British people in the, the UK. There's an underrepresentation of people from uh, minority ancestries. But we actually can measure that bias and we can do something about it and we can try and account for it, both in terms of future data collection, but also within the algorithms to some extent. You mentioned earlier that no data source is unbiased. C could you explain a bit more why that's so? And also, you talked about the statistical power. And could we hear a little bit more about that? I'll give you an example. So there's this amazing experiment going on in the UK called the UK Biobank, which is perhaps the most important and exciting biomedical experiment in the world. This experiment is collecting huge amounts of health data and biological data on half a million people with the idea that they're measured, they're followed, we see which diseases they get, we see which treatments they got, how they responded and so on, and we use that to try and understand human disease. Now, how do you get hold of half a million people? Well, what was happened was that about 10 million people were written to, and of those, about half a million said yes. Was that a biased or unbiased representation of society? It's clearly biased because it turns out those people are, I don't know, maybe twice as healthy as people of the age range compared to normal. That doesn't mean to say it's unhelpful because... Within that group, there's still plenty of variation. There's still plenty of variation in terms of lifestyle or genetics or previous disease exposure. So if there's a question you're interested in, we want to, say, measure the impact of this genetic variant on whether or not you're going to get heart disease. What matters for that? Probably two things. One is how well you can measure whether or not people get heart disease. And the other is your sample size. They're both important. Which of those is more important? It's sample size any day. Is that pretty much irrespective of whether the sample itself is heavily biased? If you want to ask questions to do with, does this genetic variant have an effect on heart disease? It turns out the bias is much less important than the sample size. I can ask people if they've had a heart attack, for example, and I get data that's almost as good as if I'd got a clinician to go through all half a million of them and grade them. If I want to work out the exact effect that genetic variant has, then I will lose a bit of information by taking that big data or using routine data to 
what's called phenotype the individuals to measure which diseases they've got. If one of these data sets is really large, does it not matter much if it's drawn exclusively from one part of the population? I mean, is it the case that a particular genetic variation in, say, white British people is likely to have the same significance if that occurs within someone from a minority ethnic background? I think what I'd say is we don't want to assume that variants will have exactly the same effects in different ancestries. They'll probably have similar. We would want to try and measure those differences. So in terms of collection, I think it's important that there's a strategy for making sure that there is some representation from everywhere, but it doesn't have to be equal representation or even proportionate representation from everywhere. As long as we can measure those biases, we can correct for them later. Right. So overall numbers are the most important thing. And it doesn't matter if in order to get those large numbers, you end up with a sample which is not representative of all the groups you want to cover. That's completely the case. One of the big lessons from the big data research program over the last few years has been just how powerful noisy sources of information can be if you get enough of them. You mentioned the power. Can you just elucidate a little bit what the power of a statistical analysis means? For a statistician like myself, power means essentially the ability to do two things. One is to estimate how big an effect is. So, for example, if you've got a blood pressure that's some fraction higher than normal, what impact is that going to have on your risk, say, of a heart attack or a stroke. I want there to be low uncertainty about the magnitude of that effect. There's a coupled question, which is, can I ask whether that effect is different from zero? I.e., does it have any effect? Is increasing your blood pressure having any negative impact on your health? So those two things are related in a statistical sense. And sample size basically directly correlates with your ability to measure an effect precisely. So if you have too small a sample size in a study, does that mean that the results are basically worthless? Effectively, yes. Medical science has suffered over the years with small sample sizes, underpowered studies, effects that are never replicated, because in some studies someone just had a fluke result and it wasn't ever replicated. The big change, I think, in biomedical research, which is interestingly coupled to the growth of artificial intelligence, has been the use of really, really large data sets and getting real, essentially, about what a statistically meaningful result actually means. That's a nice side effect, isn't it, of the focus on AI and big data, that you automatically provide checks which are going to prevent studies that were unreliable for that reason continuing to have an impact. The industrialization of data collection has been an overwhelmingly strong power for good within biomedical research. And I think initially it wasn't necessarily coupled to the AI revolution. But as a consequence, we now have enormous data sets with huge numbers of things measured, which are providing the fuel for WYSI methodologists to be able to peer in and learn things that you'd never thought of asking. How long does this sort of iteration take? I mean, suppose we have a study and it produces some results which then feed back into medical practice, and then you collect the outcomes, you feed them back in to see how accurate it's been, you maybe tweak your model so as to do it better. What sort of turnaround time are we talking there? It'll probably be different for different medical conditions, I imagine. There are many different ways that might happen, each of which has their own time scale. Suppose you're trying to use AI to train someone how to use an ultrasound well. You can feed that back within days. Suppose you're using AI to try and improve decision-making or the grading about a cancer that someone has presented with. That process can be done on the timescale of years, probably, because what matters is getting humans in to validate what the computer was saying and or waiting a few months to see whether the computer made the right decision about that particular cancer. For other things where computers are actually being used as new diagnostics or they are genuinely making decisions, then there's a process of regulation 
and trials, which has to be gone through, which naturally takes years. There are bits that can be done quickly in terms of this iteration, but there's a huge amount that's going to take years and years and years to work through. But at least we've got a sort of ratchet there, presumably, in terms of quality. Uh, One would expect it to be getting better over the scale of decades, at least, if not individual years, in quite a wide area. I think from a research perspective, we've already seen the huge benefit of many of these technologies in terms of providing the ability to differentiate between people or make good prognoses. It's going to take a bit of time to get those results into the clinic. But given their value and given that clinicians are often wanting the value of this automated decision making or automated support, there's a lot of pressure to get them through fairly quickly. I would imagine that having the National Health Service in this country probably makes widespread collection of data rather easier. Is that the case if you compare it with a country like America? I don't want to be jingoistic, but I do think that Britain is uniquely placed in the world to do this kind of work because it is sufficiently big. 65 million people is an awful lot to draw from, but it's also at the same time sufficiently coherent in terms of its organisational and regulatory structures that we can draw data from across this big population at once. The UK Biobank programme, as I mentioned, is one example which is collecting data on a scale that is pretty much impossible anywhere else in the world. China is perhaps the one exception. In terms of the depth of data, the UK is also remarkably advanced in that there's huge amounts of richness, often quite locked away in NHS systems, but there's a lot of excitement about being able to access that. Just over the last few days, a couple of big projects have been announced, government-led projects which bring in industry and combine with the NHS and academia to fund big programmes in radiology and digital pathology, precisely about being able to access data, both the imaging but also the clinical and the outcome data and all the associated biological measurement to precisely fuel this this AI revolution. Our last podcast actually was on China and obviously they have tremendous potential but presumably it's good for the planet in general that there are there, there's more than one place being able to do this effectively on, on very different populations. Absolutely. We need algorithms that work irrespective of where they're being applied. The more data that we can collect, the better. I think what is remarkable about the UK and our approach here has been our openness around data sharing and the willingness of participants within the UK to share what is highly sensitive at some level and personal data for the purposes of research with people they've never met, uh, for purposes they probably don't understand, but where there is real long-term benefit to the population as a whole. One might expect that in the wake of recent data scandals, people might be getting rather more reluctant to share their data. Has Have you noticed that? Within biomedical research and data collection, I think it's fair to say that historically issues around privacy and consent and security have been paramount. They've always been at the forefront. Many of the challenges we're seeing around the big data, security, privacy challenges, they're coming from areas where the data revolution is a bit new, you know, around Facebook data or um, search history on, on Google. The collection and use of medical data is an incredibly regulated area. And I think it's certainly historically that regulation has provided people with a sense of security, that their data will be used appropriately. I think it also helps to have the NHS there, who is ultimately the custodian of much of this information. I don't want to seem complacent because I think there are a lot of challenges. I think the excitement from companies about coming in to make use of these data and drive profits, the excitement from the government about the value that is inherent within these data will create 
intentions which are perhaps not totally aligned to expectations that individuals might have about who is accessing their data and for what reasons. That's something that I think we can work through. It needs open dialogue. It needs a very public presentation of what is being done and why it's being done and the case to be made for why, for example, we need companies being able to access your data. Uh, but I think at the moment, we're in a remarkably good place. It sounds as though you think the data environment in the past has been quite benign with people giving their trust, but also the systems deserving their trust. Do you feel we've now got sufficient focus on that, that we can be reasonably confident that it's going to move forward in a, in a beneficial way? I think it's very important not to be naive about it and not to be hidden about it either. Again, just going back to the UK Biobank. So when people gave their data, they, they were giving it in the understanding that they wouldn't necessarily benefit from it. The NHS might not even necessarily benefit from it. And that there were companies who would be using those data to advance themselves and to develop products which would increase their value without that value necessarily going back to the NHS or the individuals directly. So that's built into that project and I think it's being built into a lot of what is happening in terms of the use of data within the NHS for commercial uses. The thinking behind it being that these advances in technology will ultimately improve our healthcare system, they'll improve outcomes for patients. It's in our interest for these companies to do well because they will give us good products and the way that we're going to get there fastest is by using the data appropriately but what we have to be very careful about is that we don't monetize the data itself. We don't essentially sell the data. We use the data that is your data as a fuel for these uh, other companies, but we would let any company look at it. We presumably also don't want to use the data in a way that could potentially disadvantage the individual's concern. For example, if it was used to rate them for insurance, you can imagine people might become very reluctant to even have tests performed if they know that that might feed back into higher premiums. I think the use of genetic data for making decisions about individuals where they're not asking for that decision to be made, like should, should this treatment be given or not, that's clearly a really critical area. Uh, within the US, there's legislation that prevents that within the UK we essentially have a, sit a healthcare system that stops that being useful. That doesn't mean to say there aren't loopholes or there aren't societies around the world where that could potentially happen. I think it's something we all need to keep a strong eye on. And if we see companies moving towards that, then there needs to be action taken. Because for the reasons you've given, it's absolutely crucial that people should feel comfortable giving their data in the largest numbers we can manage in order to benefit everyone. Yes, I think that the risks associated with people refusing to give their data, the impact of that is would be so strong on this whole area of research, it would grind to a halt if we lost public trust. So it's absolutely paramount that that trust is maintained. Thank you very much, Gil. That's a great note on which to end. It's been a very interesting conversation. Thank you. Next to join us is Sandra Vachter, a lawyer and research fellow in data ethics, AI, robotics, internet regulation and cybersecurity at the Oxford Internet Institute, whom we met in episode two. Great to see you again, Sandra. That's wonderful to be here again. We fairly briefly discussed issues surrounding junk news, but it raises a lot of deep issues on, on, on which you've touched in your research. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yes, I think the junk news issue is probably one of the most famous and prominent examples that describes a deeper problem that we're currently facing, which has to do with, with micro-targeting and nudging and, and profiling people. And together with, with my colleague, Brent Middlestead, we, we just published a new paper two months ago, which is called A Right to Reasonable Inferences, Rethinking Data Protection Law in the Age of Big Data and AI, because there's so much data available about us now. 
and it's constantly being collected and assessed and evaluated that we have very little understanding what companies and the public sector actually know about us. For example, the, um, the Cambridge Analytica case where it was possible to infer based on profile data what kind of political stances people had. So when you talk about the companies knowing a lot about us, this isn't just confined to things as we've put out there. They're drawing all sorts of inferences about us, which may often be rather reliable inferences. Is that is that right? Yes, exactly. I think this is where the the big paradigm shift is happening. Traditionally, I I would just give you a piece of information about my personality, and I would have a very good understanding what that information tells you about me. I could tell you my name or my age or my gender, and that's the information that you have. But based on those variables, you can then infer even more information about me, maybe information that I never wanted to share with you in the first place. One interesting example is when you use Facebook. Facebook is able to infer um, sexual orientation, race, and gender, based on their online activities. So this is something that the user never disclosed with the platform, but the algorithms are able to infer those kinds of sensitive attributes based on the clicking behavior. On advertisements or um, likes, dislikes? What yes, kind of thing? so the, the posts that you put on Facebook, the, the things that you like on Facebook, um, the people that you follow, um, every, every interaction with, with the platform will be used to assess you. Does that include when you're just clicking around, may, maybe you think randomly following links that look interesting or things that other, those of your friends maybe have yes. highlighted and yes. you, you click on one and it says, ah, he's interested in this. Yes, exactly. And it's not just what you do, it's also what your friends do, which forms the basis for your assessment. So for example, there are companies that decide if somebody should get a loan based on Facebook profiles, but not just the information that the user puts on there, but also what kind of friends they have. So they look at your circles that you surround yourself with, your background, your education, and then they infer if you're going to be likely to default on a loan or not. And that may be looking at information that they have got or inferred about those friends as well. Yes, exactly. So this goes pretty deep. This goes pretty deep, yes. What are you suggesting we do about that? We need to come up with new creative ways of protecting privacy. We always talk about data protection. And I think the, the term is actually a bit misleading because we actually don't need to protect data. We need to protect humans and their privacy. Therefore, we need to think about what privacy actually means. What's the value of privacy? Why do we need it in a democracy? And privacy is not just about data protection. It's also about um, reputation. It's about identity. It's about the ability to express yourself and represent yourself, to have a right to own your image, to change your personality. That's all basically what privacy means. Now, if algorithms and big data is doing that for us, we have very little control over how we're being perceived by third parties. So basically everything, every data trail that you leave behind becomes your digital personality. And sometimes that might not be accurate and we have very little means to understand how our personalities, digital identities are being made up and very little recourse to um, rectify it if we feel it's not accurate. From the sound of it, accuracy isn't the only issue here, right? You're, you would be concerned if inferences we, were being drawn yes. about you. Yes. Even if they were 100% accurate, yes. it might be inferences that you would rather were not drawn. Yes. I think that's something that is very concerning and I think something that which we cannot solve with consent because very often if I consent to my data being collected or assessed I really can't foresee what the data will say about me I can say it's fine that you know you collect my clicking behavior and that you monitor what newspapers I read but I have no idea if reading The Guardian twice a week is going to affect my interest rates in a positive or a negative way. There is no intuitive link between what I do online and how it's being assessed. And therefore, I think we need to think about normative, acceptable standards for inference drawing. Is it socially acceptable to monitor everything that we do online, to use it then for very important decisions when we have really no intuitive understanding of about how it's being assessed? We can separate, can't we, the drawing of the inference from the acting on the inference. So it's one thing to say that a company can't use information to draw tentative conclusions about you that it might use, say, for targeting adverts in your direction. 
which arguably is relatively okay because it's up to you whether you go for the advertisement or not. That's rather different, isn't it, from a company drawing inferences that it then uses to deny you a mortgage or whatever it might be. Yeah, absolutely right. It's, it's two problems. One has to do with the question, is it socially acceptable that you infer sensitive information about me, even though I might not be aware of it? So the question of, you know, is it is it okay that you infer sexual orientation based on clicking behavior? Will often be very closely linked with the second question, if that inference is then being used to make a decision. The decision could be to show a certain advertisement, to deny a loan, um, to not give a good interest rate for insurance. That's the that's the second problem. But those last two are different, right, from the advertising one. I mean, or do you think they're not? Do you think there is a serious moral question about the targeting of advertising? Yeah. And what would you say to somebody who says, no, it's entirely up to you what adverts you follow. Uh, why shouldn't Facebook or wherever make money from the advertising, after all, that's what enables them to give us a free service. Yeah, it will very much depend what kind of advertising we are talking about. Google had problems in the past where they were showing job ads with lower wages to women than they are showing to men. So that's not something where I think this should be in the private autonomy of the decision maker because, you know, we, we're fighting for equality between genders. So using, inferring gender and then making decisions based on that if it's even if it's just showing a job advertisement could have detrimental effects for the individual because you might not have the option to see what jobs are out there and therefore you cannot apply for them right so it shouldn't necessarily be left to the private autonomy and and similar maybe it's also discrimination problem if we're inferring race or gender or religious beliefs and offering certain advertisements based on that, that's a protected attribute. So it could be an actual discrimination problem if we're showing different advertisements to certain group of people. Now, it might be then that they don't actually explicitly infer gender or age or whatever at any point at all. But nevertheless, the advertisements that are offered are strongly correlated with these features. Yeah. Are, are you saying even that should be banned? First, I'm not saying that anything should be banned. I'm just thinking that we might need more protection in certain types of areas when it comes to targeting. I'm, I'm not saying that we need to regulate everything. But for certain types of decision making and, and profiling, we might need to think about certain safeguards. It's, it's not a, a binary question. I think we have to be um, looking at a specific application, talk about the risks that are associated with them, and then think about, you know, solutions that find a good middle ground between between those things. Some people might say, well, it's fair enough then that you're actually helping the people who see the advertisements by showing them those ones that are, frankly, they're more likely to be interested in and to take. Mm -hmm. So aren't you doing social engineering if you on the basis of some egalitarian assumption, show them uh, advertisements which historically ha have not either been so appealing or so successful. Yeah, but we have to question why they have not been appealing in the past. So if you don't take that into account, then you're just going to reinforce the problems that we had in the past and not going to give people the opportunity to actually you know, change the past. Because, you know, if you look at what we have done recently or over the last centuries, I wouldn't say that we have been particularly good at making decisions. I, I think selection effects can play a very big role too. So I can imagine that with advertising, there is a real risk that if you target at women advertisements that previous women have been attracted to, you're losing the opportunity to change those biases that are there in our society, which may not actually be there for any devious or, or, or negative reason. Yeah, algorithms work in the way that they look at, at historical data, find similarities, and based on the similarities, predict the future. So if the past has been that women are more likely to actually accept lower wages jobs because they stayed at home, it's predicting that this will also be the case in the future. But the model of modern women is changing. So you should adjust that in a way to give, you know, women the opportunity to make a choice if, if they want to have a full-time position or, you know, a part-time position. Another point, I suspect, is the effect of peer pressure. And if that's reinforced by bias from advertising as well, that's just 
yes making it worse right yes and i think we we actually need to change the the in, in environment as well to make you know certain professions more attractive to women because it's not just at the point when you decide if somebody should be admitted to a certain subject at university it's also about having a support net for those women especially if they're breaking into a male dominated area i mean i'm, I'm a lawyer i work in tech so I, i i know the battles that you have to fight when you come in there um and i imagine it's 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 the same for for every tech related discipline Probably. is one implication of this that algorithms which are doing their mysterious work actually need to be told to reveal their inner workings as it were because the the gender bias or the racial bias or whatever might be completely hidden might be opaque and there's nothing explicitly representing that in the algorithm or in the the information storage if we're going to counter this are we going to have to force them or their writers their designers to reveal more of what's going on underneath yes i think that's exactly spot on and and exactly the the point that i've been advocating for for quite some time um because i feel that um real ai accountability can only be achieved if explanations are offered um to the individual that is affected by an algorithm so that means if if i didn't get the job or i was shown a certain advertisement or i was you know predicted to default on a loan or something like that i should have a right that this is being explained to me especially when very complex methods are used that could potentially be very discriminative and biased actually the problem here is that the more complex the method the more difficult it will be to give the explanation right so isn't this putting a a huge extra cost on the companies that pr- produce these algorithms so we just uh, wrote a paper that is called explaining explanations in ai because we wanted to figure out what a good explanation would actually look like and we were talking about from a philosophical and legal perspective what are the things that you want to know and then we had chris russell who is a machine learning expert that explained um what's technically feasible and what the discrepancies are. And what we found is that there are a lot of explanatory tools that are being developed in the machine learning community, but they have very different goals to what an individual would actually want to know when they are be subject to a Can decision. Can you give an example? Yeah, so for example, machine learning uh, community want explanations because they want to debug their system. They want to improve performance. So that's a very different narrative than trying to ensure that justice has been served or there is non-discriminatory outcome or something like that. Based on that finding, we then came up with the idea of counterfactual explanations. So counterfactual in the sense that philosophers think that counterfactual explanations are good, and in machine learning there is something that is called computing a counterfactual, which means um you can explain what happened in the decision making model um based on the parameters that you fed into them. So counterfactual here that means if things had been yes. thus and so yes. different yes. then the decision would have yes. been different exactly and the way that we proposed it is that for example you would you have been denied a loan and a counterfactual that you could compute even in a very n- complicated neural network would say you have been denied a loan because your income was 40,000 pounds if it had been 45,000 pounds we would have offered you the loan and that would deal with a lot of the concerns that you have raised by saying well you know it's very complicated we cannot explain that counterfactual is something that you can compute even in high complex systems and very often um companies maybe don't want to explain how the system work because of the proprietary nation um uh, uh, nature of their algorithm but with counterfactuals you would only give very limited information to the person which wouldn't necessarily um allow competitors to to go and run with that and it would be actually very ma- meaningful for the individual because if i tell you it was your income it was your cover letter it was typos in your application then you would have a sense of what did actually go wrong and have some indication to you know change your behavior and maybe get the result in the future it sounds to me as though what we mean by an explanation here is a very different thing in the two cases so an explanation of how an algorithm reaches its result for a computer scientist would be well here is the process that it went through but you're not talking about that you're talking about an explanation in the sense of why did it give this particular outcome meaning 
what different inputs might have led to a different outcome. Yes, exactly. That's the that's the big difference. And it's an advantage and a disadvantage because the advantage is we don't need to understand the whole system, as you said. That's not the thing that we're Which interested in. Which is just as well because that would be extraordinarily difficult it would be for very, very pretty much difficult. anybody. But it would be very difficult for everybody. And if you think about what the thing is that you would actually want to know, yeah. that's not the thing. If I didn't get the loan and somebody gives me the source code and says, this is the explanation, I would be very angry. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's not the thing that I'm actually looking for. Especially I want something if it's different. the source code of a machine learning algorithm, yes. where e even if you're an expert computer yeah. scientist, you can't really Absolutely, yeah. understand and it. Yeah. Counterfactual explanation would therefore strike a very good balance. Um, it would not require um, fully understanding the system, but it would give some meaningful information to individual without infringing on trade secrets or intellectual property rights. I presume rights. it would also be relatively easy to implement. Yes, because it is. Because all you do is run the same algorithm with different parameters yes. and tell the person what the result would have been. Yes, so Google actually has implemented our idea just recently, I think two months ago in their, in their TensorFlow um, board. Um, so now you can actually play with that. So the idea seemed to be very appealing to, to tech companies as well. I'm not surprised. I mean, that is, it kind of gets them off the hook in a way, in a nice way, in that it gives them something that they can do that isn't requiring them to do either deep theoretical work or something that could be extraordinarily costly. Yeah, I think it's not so much getting them off the hook. It's, it's I think there are often ways of making where you have a win-win situation. Yeah. Um, and I think that would be one of those things where, where actually both parties win. The individual would understand what happened and um, a company could show that they value transparency and accountability at the same time. Yeah, when I say gets them off the hook, what I mean is some people have given the impression that companies would need to be able to explain their algorithms in a, in a far more theoretically deep way. And that, as you say, is, is, is almost impossible. Yeah, if you're... that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. And I think it's very, very important that the field of interpretation uh, interpretability is pursued and yes. we should move towards yeah. really understanding what's going sure. on i think that's that's the future trajectory but that's a huge research project yeah but that's it? yeah it's going to involve computer scientists yeah. and philosophers absolutely, and, absolutely. Uh, yeah. but what we're saying is there's something that you can do in the interim yeah. until we're there but keep pushing um the envelope as much as possible and, and am i right not just in the interim this is something that you'd want to apply permanently isn't it yes definitely yeah. um and until we have something that is better. But Sandra, is that going to solve the problem we were talking about earlier? That in fact, the algorithm that decides whether to give me the loan is relying on things like my choice of car, which might give an indication of whether I like risky behaviour or not, or whether I pursue sports or whatever it yeah. might be. We don't want the systems to be able to use that information yes. at all. I think you're putting your finger exactly on the, on the right problem. The way that I envision it, I think true accountability comes from two sides. Um, one has to do with governing inferences and one has to do with explanations. I think explanations are a very good step to increase accountability because it tells you why something happened. But explanations are not justifications. Just because I'm informing you of my decision doesn't mean the decision was good in the first place. It doesn't mean that the data that I was using was justified, legitimate, socially acceptable. So you would need to have a counterpart, which is actually before the decision has been made. And think about acceptable parameters, reasonable inferences that you're allowed to draw about a person when you make a decision. So we have to think about what is the data that is socially acceptable to use? What are the methods that are acceptable to use? Is it okay to infer sexual orientation, political stances for making decisions on loans? And when you do that, after you make the decision, you need to explain that. So it's basically tackling the problem before decision making and after decision making. And then you would actually achieve accountability as a whole. Is there going to be any end to this? I mean, that is certain obvious biases have been identified and we now deal with those. Are we going to go on detecting more and more perhaps increasingly subtle biases, is the logical end of all this that we simply don't base our decisions on this? No, absolutely not. I think it just shows that ethics is not a box-taking exercise. I think ethics is lifelong learning. 
Um, and it is about evaluating good choices on a daily basis and making sure that we um, take into account how our societies are changing, um, that we take into account where we want to go and the society that we envision, and that we're constantly shaping our future. And that's, I think, how ethics should be lived. Lots more work into the future for philosophers, lawyers, and the rest of us thinking about these issues. Absolutely. <laughs> that's a good note to finish. Thank you very much, Sandra. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Next up is someone we've been trying to get on the podcast for quite a while. Sir Nigel Shadbolt, Principal of Jesus College, a professorial research fellow in the Department of Computer Science and the chairman of the Open Data Institute, which he co-founded with Sir Tim Berners-Lee. Thanks for coming, Nigel. Pleasure to be here, Peter. I wanted to start by asking a general question about our research into AI. How do you think this field has changed over the last few decades? I think it's changed hugely. I think the audacity, the ambition still remains, which is the attempt by building programs that in some sense are adaptive, reflective. This has always been the grand ambition of AI. I think we used to imagine it would be more about cognitive emulation, you know, the idea that our programs would be smart by, in some sense, replicating how humans solve problems. And I think over the decades, we've seen a very strong tradition of engineering solutions to problems in AI, where the solution isn't necessarily embodied in animals or humans at all, but has nevertheless been quite successful. And I think if we go back through the history of AI, we can clearly see very marked decades of particular forms of methods and enthusiasms to solve particular types of problems. So could you give some examples? I mean, when I began uh, in the field, I went up to read for my PhD at Edinburgh in 1978. We were very much in what we called the good old-fashioned AI period. In fact, the assumption was based on the notion of symbol uh, manipulation. And many of the approaches were rooted in logic, for example. Uh, they were rooted in the explicit formulation of rules and procedures. That's how we thought we would, for example, build natural language understanding systems or visual recognition systems. So a great deal of work was around building languages, AI-specific languages, to help build these kinds of systems. And a great deal of thought was given to the modes of inference, the methods of reasoning with and representing the world in terms of rules and procedures. And, and in fact, that gave birth to one of the first flowerings of AI, one of the first times that governments around the world got interested in the 1980s. In the UK, this was called the ALVI program, the so-called intelligent knowledge-based systems approach, building rule bases that try to capture some aspect of human performance. I actually ended up getting my job at Leeds in computer science and philosophy thanks to that. There was a lot of worry about the Japanese fifth generation project and the government decided to make some investments in young people going into universities in relevant positions and, and mine was one of them. The promise did not really uh, get fulfilled, did it? Well, that's terribly interesting. It's why I think that looking back into our reasonably recent history is so interesting because the same claims and worries were around in the 1980s. The Japanese robots and production lines, the AI automated manufacturing were going to take all our jobs. They were going to usurp human decision making. There were ethical worries about this problem. There were issues around whether or not you could understand the reasoning of machines. Now, all of this within a rather different uh, method set than we're using now, but they were the same issues. We had a skill shortage. How would we train enough PhD students and so on? Where were the courses that would be on offer in our universities? Very resonant of questions that we hear asked today. I think it did get quite a long way, actually. I would make the claim that many rule-based systems became compiled into the next generation of rather routine computer science. And so rule-based systems manage engines, literally your car engine. They manage trading floors still. They manage a whole range of situation assessment or medical diagnostic systems. Not everything is being solved by the most modern and recent neural network. There are plenty of places for these rule-based systems. They just didn't deliver the whole gamut and range of what was promised for them. So do you think the hype was a positive thing because it focused such a lot of energy in that area of development, which, as you say, brought quite a lot of 
positive results? Or is the hype partly negative too, because when the systems produced don't live up to the ambition that they'd started off with, people will be disappointed and maybe go too far the other way. Yeah, I think that's very interesting. I think both. I actually think that we understood quite early on that this problem of building generalized intelligence was hard, that along the way we solved some very interesting uh, intermediate problems. And we did deliver on a number of hope for outputs. You know, there were systems built. It trained a cadre of new researchers, people like you and myself, you know, and others, many of our colleagues. It allowed us, it gave us permission to build careers in this area. I mean, remember that prior to this, there was pretty well a shutdown of AI, particularly in the UK and elsewhere, uh, due to the um, Lighthill report. James Lighthill, Lucasian professor of mathematics at Cambridge, had written this damning report in the 70s, which pretty well shut down every piece of AI research bar two or three centres in the UK. So this was a welcome re-injection of intent. And I think the other thing that happened was that as we bruised our toe on these really hard problems... A bunch of people were looking for new methods, new techniques to solve the problems of artificial intelligence. And that led a decade later to the emergence of very different modes of programming, genetic algorithms, for example, a range of new machine learning techniques, some of which were neural network based. They were the precursors to the, the modern neural networks, so-called parallel distributed processing. And biological inspiration played quite a role there, didn't it? Both with regard to neural networks, but also you mentioned genetic algorithms. Yes, it did. And that's, uh, that's very interesting. That goes back to, to some really deep history, I think, in our subject, a topic that I know has been covered already in these podcasts, the origination in areas like cybernetics and uh, the work of people like Gray Walters, where there was an attempt to build electronic organisms, self-contained systems, which had purposes and goals that could uh, uh, kind of recharge themselves, could navigate their environments. And so there was a whole slew of work, um, some of this pioneered by people like Rodney Brooks at MIT, who wrote this very seminal paper uh, in the Artificial Intelligence Journal in the 90s um, called uh, Elephants Don't Play Chess, which was a recognition that complete organisms in the world can be very successful, very adaptive, very effective in their environments without having to do all the logic processing or the symbolic computation that our earlier generation of machines uh, were operating with. And so that allowed us to explore new architectures, new ways of designing systems. In fact, people even worried whether it was designed at all because they attempted to evolve systems. And uh, this was a brute force experimentation to come up with new forms of circuits, new forms of body layout. And by looking very carefully in biology, we, we got some extraordinary insights, the whole area of biomimetic systems. You know, what could we copy from nature its successful experiments and put directly into our robots. There's an interesting interplay there, isn't there? Because the evolutionary methods, in a sense, copy nature. They copy the evolutionary method that we see happening in nature. But the results don't necessarily produce things that mimic the way that nature does it. No, that's true. And I think that that, that caused a challenge for that whole field. Was how could it kind of account for the designs that were produced? What we did find, actually, uh, and that is a bit resonant of, of, of uh, some of the challenges we find in modern neural networks, were very surprising solutions which exploited aspects of the um, problem space or indeed when you're trying to design a material robot, some of the materials uh, features in ways that were completely unexpected by the original builders of the program. Another thing that I suspect was quite a surprise was that even in the area I mean Rodney Brooks you were mentioning talking about chess I mean chess is a, a field where you might have expected that good old-fashioned AI would have provided a way of, of mimicking human thought but in fact when chess computers became really strong and beat Garry Kasparov of course famously they were working in ways very different from those that a human chess player yeah, and, and that was interesting because, again, in the days, uh, my Edinburgh days, there were uh, people working uh, literally down in the basement, uh, Donald Meekie's group, on seeking to emulate world-class chess problem solving. And, of course, it was only you know, a decade or so later, 1996, 97, when Kasparov lost his first game, then the entire match the following year. Uh, and Deep Blue wasn't playing 
chess in any way that a human did. It was searching millions and millions of positions a second, hundreds of millions, in fact. But it was still, in some sense, uh, looking at the board and evaluating positions very systematically. It did apply heuristics, so it would favour some types of moves over others. It did have databases full of opening and closing moves, you know, standard gambits. Um, but no, it certainly wasn't playing uh, chess anyway like a human would. So this style of playing chess kind of reveals something quite important to uh, those of us working in the field, which was there are lots of ways of being smart that aren't smart like us. And so over the years and decades, I think AI has at different times with different methods occupied in a sense its interest in different parts of this cognitive spe or space of cognitive possibilities. You know, how could you build a system to solve a problem? How could you engineer it? And sometimes we relied a lot on symbolic methods from logic, from uh, rule-based reasoning. Other times we've moved to statistically based methods. And that interplay between those approaches has been very interesting. It is very striking in a way that we are not necessarily good at predicting what methods will turn out in the long term to be the best. Do you think that that's a yeah, fair thing to say? I think it is a fair thing to say. And so um, one of the ways I think you can understand the development of the AI paradigm has been an expansion of that method set. And it's very much the case that in the solutions of the future, you will reach for methods which have been established in the canon of AI for decades. Much of our fault tolerant or critical system reasoning is done using logical theorem proving and you wouldn't want it any way else because no. you want it to be rigorously and provably correct but then you'll blend these other methods in and, and as i say as we went through the 90s we saw a real interest in uh, biologically inspired computing neural networks but then as we fell into the 2000s something very interesting happened we noticed the web ai got the web quite late actually and as we began to notice the web the question was, well, if we could regard the web as a kind of huge distributed database, how could we inject a little semantics into the web content itself so that our machines could more effectively integrate and reason over that content? And that was the birth of the so-called semantic web project. And how far has that gone? Well, people often declare it as a bit of a failure, but I think it's been pretty successful in the sense that we don't quite have the automated reasoning agents that pour over these uh, logical proofs distributed on the web. But what we have found is that companies from Google to Facebook have been injecting uh, a little semantics, representations about what the content refers to and how it links together into millions of web pages. And that little semantics has gone a long way. And it's allowed us to be much more effective about pulling information together often not seen, often not even referred to as the semantic web, but this richer representation of web content has been a real boon. And do you see that going much further? I mean, that is, is putting more and more semantic information there encoded within the web, is that going to bring much richer fruits in the future? I think that's an unfinished project. I think as people begin to realise... So here's the interesting dilemma. Again, it was a field of inquiry where we perhaps became too obsessed by the logical precision of how that information representation at web scale could work. And of course, what the originator of the web always said was that it worked because to scale, it allowed the links to fail. It didn't require logical consistency across all the structure of the web. That in some sense, to demand logical rigor across diverse content brought together for various purposes is asking for too much. So we certainly need to look for techniques that aren't so demanding. And there are areas where the rigor of logic can work for perfect, perfectly well for a part of the problem. But in other cases, you're looking to amalgamate information in this rather looser way. And that has got much further to go. And I think we're beginning to see that happen where the markup that's beginning to happen, good example is, is data on the web. And uh, uh, a number of the big search companies and, and, and internet platforms, uh, people like Google, have developed this method, uh, schema.org, which is a metadata markup, or in other words, information about the information on web pages that say, this is data, it's this kind of data, this is how you can find out more about this type of data. And those clues, that, that kind of signposting of web content, offers huge uh, promise. And presumably this approach fits nicely with what we've seen in recent years with lots of hype, the rise of deep learning, use of big data and using that data not through precise logical inference but rather finding patterns within it. 
Yes, that's right. And I think, again, interestingly, as I was working with uh, with, with, with Tim Berners-Lee and others on this semantic web project in, in, in the 2000s, along the way, we were being asked by governments and other agencies to try and get more data released on the web at web scale. In fact, that led to this whole, um, one of the things that arose from that was the so-called open data movement. There had always been data on the web, of course, there'd always been open data, but this was to try and generate a set of policy expectations and defaults whereby governments who collected a lot of this data didn't relate to individual personal data, stuff about when the trains ran, with the timetables, uh, where the schools are, all that routine public data could be made available openly. And that, of course, turns out to be one of the key ingredients for modern machine learning methods and big data analytics are intrinsically data hungry. So we're now at a period where we've got lots of data on the web. It's being increasingly exploited by algorithms and AI systems. But the the AI systems that everybody is making such a big noise about these days are the deep learning systems. These go back to the earlier neural net systems. They do indeed. I mean, they are um, extraordinary, I should say, as as, as, uh, both approaches and realizations. They've arisen partly um, due to deeper understanding of what might be possible with these architectures. But I have to say, they also have been fundamentally dependent on the extraordinary exponential increase in computing power that's available to us. And actually almost a, a, an accidental byproduct of the fact that people building special purpose chips to process graphics in all the game stations out there produced the perfect processor for neural networks. So the graphical processing units, which are able to represent layers of these networks, can be stacked yay high and give you layer on layer of neural network architecture. And in some sense, the deeper the layers, the further you can go, the more you can structure that network to look for those deep patterns deep within the data. This is a nice example, isn't it, again, of of the sort of experimental nature of research because techniques that were developed back in the 1980s, 1990s, which seemed rather to fizzle out because we simply didn't have the computational power to exploit them, it turns out, perhaps surprisingly, a couple of decades later, that they have this tremendous power If only you have enough computer power, enough data. Indeed. And you can do things with these methods which which appear to be extraordinary. Uh, You don't have to worry about the limitations of the hardware and computing architecture now. You know that you've got all of that power. Now the question is, can you feed the algorithm with enough examples, with enough labelled amounts of data, or indeed not even that in some cases, that it can actually optimize the output function you're interested in whether it's to tell one face from another or to recognize an example of an image as a particular kind of thing and so on there's been an explosion a flourishing of methods and variants on the deep neural network paradigm and it's not all been about hardware it's about people who have been drawn into this who have seen ways to modify enhance enrich the network architectures that are on offer So we're now in a period of significant growth there, a lot of investment, a lot of very bright people coming in and doing work there. So again, we've got lots of hype about where this is going to lead. And we know from the past, from predictions, all sorts of things, from computer chess to processing of languages and so forth, that it's very hard to see where it will lead. But do do you want to make some suggestions? It's a tremendously exciting journey at the moment because these new methods are, in their particular context, delivering remarkable results, whether it's to sort of tell millions of faces apart and recognise them, whether it's to learn to play chess uh, to a level that no previous chess programme could at all. You know, this whole idea of setting these networks one against the other to continuously improve. And I think that's going to keep on delivering, particularly we know in areas that are susceptible. Pattern recognition is a good one. Lots of image recognition. Image recognition through time. So how do you begin to build in the fourth dimension into this ability to discriminate and classify? And I think we can go a long way with these techniques. What I am um, sceptical of are the claims that general 
AI is just over the horizon because there'll be this inevitable increase in intrinsic capability. I think we still understand relatively little about what the components for an effective self-aware reflective system are and that we will find that general AI, the ability that we have to see across tasks, to understand the context we're in, that we are deeply embedded in a social and a physical environment. These are still very remote from our programs and our machines. And the other problem we have with these systems is having them be accountable to us in some form so that we can understand their inner operations in a way that maps onto a way of we would want to make sense of the world. Perhaps those issues are related. Do you think it's fair when deep learning systems are criticised for being good at just one thing? Well, I think we have, again, uh, back to the kind of claim, you know, there are lots of ways of being smart that aren't smart like us. So super intelligent task achieving architectures where task X is chess or go or whatever your particular task is, are remarkable additions to our world of technology and our world of experience. That will lead to a world that we populated by these multitude of thin slivers of capability. Idio savant. Yes. And then the question will be, well, how do these get things get joined together? Now, I think what, 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 what uh, manufacturers and what consumers will require is some narrative across the top that makes it appear as if these things have a, a unified experience or a unified uh, uh, capability. And, and this is a little bit what's happening with the um, Internet of Things and the Alexas and uh, home helps uh, that we see the Amazon Echoes, and they even talk about acquiring new skills. But in a sense, the digital avatar, the persona, there's no one at home in those circuits. It is simply a presentational device to make us feel uh, more at ease with a range of information that's being presented to us. Uh, And that will present some interesting challenges to us going forward, but we've always anthropomorphised into our technology. Yeah, anthropomorphism can make us more comfortable with these objects. Uh, Presumably, there's also a danger that it'll make us rather too confident in their abilities, where they may be extremely good at a few specific things for which they've been trained, but then things fall through the gaps. And because we're anthropomorphizing, we... We assume that they are generally intelligent individuals when they're not. And they don't sit in that deep, social, connected world of human interactions and experiences. They don't sit in those fine nuances that make so much of our world work. And and that's a critical uh, uh, issue, I think. Do, Do you think there's a danger, therefore, in us becoming too comfortable with artificial intelligences? In other words... The systems are designed precisely to be user-friendly. So people are lulled into this sense that they're dealing with another agent like themselves. Well, we're remarkably um, prone to do that. And right from the cradle to the grave, more or less. Actually, at the beginning, at the end of life, some of the most interesting challenges around yes. this will be as we deploy AI into into the teddy bears of tomorrow or the elder care assistants of tomorrow. There'll be this real issue for us about... Um, how we feel that balance of interest is working out. And we will ascribe, uh, we will have feelings for these systems, uh, whether unreciprocated or not. They will be unreciprocated. Uh, (laughs) But in some sense, uh, that won't stop us constructing these these stories, these uh, comforts. And that's not to say that there won't be any merit in all of that, but it will be an interesting new form of our presence in our lives. And of course, extend that to the avatar that reflects your habits, your speech habits, all the things you knew and is kept by your loved ones as a posthumous memento. Gosh. (laughs) Yes. So these will be real live challenges without the question, is there really anybody at home in the circuits? They'll still present interesting societal challenges. Yes. And uh, I'm presumably from a commercial point of view, the systems that are most liable to be interpreted in this sort of way are ones that are going to sell well. Right? Of course. I mean, if you have a teddy bear which has a more plausible character, that, that absolutely that, that's going to sell better. <laughs> that is the super toy. I remember reading, uh, I remember watching uh, Spielberg's um, film AI, which was in some respects rather odd. Uh, but the most plausible character in the whole thing was the uh, super toy Teddy, <laughs> which was this kind of companion for the. Uh, 
the alleged real AI David. But I mean, it, it's it's definitely something that will be in our world uh, very soon, is getting deployed right now. And so the questions about the ethical boundaries, and I, I think that brings me on to another deep issue in this whole uh, landscape, which is our rights and responsibilities around the data that we generate in these contexts. We uh, try to shine a light on what the data ecosystem looks like, data that's being used to feed a whole host of analytics, some of which, much of which is AI inspired uh, using neural networks. Uh, We ourselves are using those same networks to try and make sense of the landscape we're revealing. So so to give an example, uh, we've taken the apps uh, that live on many people's phones. The ones we can easily get at actually are the apps that live on the Android Play Store. So the ones that, uh, the Google Play Store, the ones that live on your Android phones. Uh, it's rather more difficult to get into Apple's world. So we downloaded a million of those apps. A million? A million apps. And we've um, built a essentially a software harness, um, a, a set of programs that decompiles the code of each of those apps, looks looks inside and analyzes where the data flows are. Uh, we can do that statically uh, or we can do it dynamically where we actually kind of have a program that's generating sets of inputs to the app and just seeing what comes out. And what we see is an extraordinary landscape of data flows between various intermediaries, third parties, people doing the various forms of tracking that we're kind of aware of, uh, which companies own the trackers, what geographic jurisdictions are they in, what are the purposes the data is being collected for. This was recently featured, uh, I think, in the FT and also on the BBC uh, websites as um, apps out of control. Well, what we're trying to point out was that there is huge importance in us having some awareness of what data is being collected and where it's going. And people may feel this is all being taken care of, but it certainly isn't. And and, and we're actually at a stage where even the market regulators uh, don't have the insights that we now have on this landscape because, you know, who has actually downloaded the data at this scale and had had a look at it? And the fact of the matter is it's actually um, more or less an area where there is an arms race. So the app developers themselves often don't want to disclose where the data is going. So there are various forms to obfuscate or or uh, encrypt, encrypt yeah. that data. So it's a very interesting space. Our belief is that for really important reasons in deploying your technology, particularly analytically decision-making, AI-enhanced programs, you do want to know where the data is going. You do want to know what purpose it's apparently being collected for. You do want to know what the consequences of having a suite of software on your phone is and that we need available and immediate ways of making sense of that world. Is the world of regulation keeping up with all this, the GDPR? I think that is the fascinating question. I think there are some initial steps. And whenever I talk to people in the regulatory field, it is a question and a worry they have uh, that things move so fast, that the rates of change, um, the rates of development are so great. And such that we actually have to spend quite a lot of time with that many apps and that much data ourselves on all of those apps and whether data flows are using AI techniques to learn the patterns, to learn what is indicative about particular types of software application to give some power back to us, the users. Not that we should own our data, but we should have at least some rights and entitlements to know what's going on. AI actually provides a best defence ultimately against abuse of AI. Do you know what? I think that's great truth. The deep truth in all of this is that um, offensive and defensive AI will be part of the competition for ideas and everything else in the 21st century. There's quite an irony, isn't there, that you're striking this blow by analysing all these algorithms, which is, as it were, fighting back should actually be what prompts a lot of people to throw their hands up in the air and say, oh dear, these things are out of control. Well, again, it's not a matter of control so much as these things sometimes happen almost by stealth. And then when people look around and the unintended consequence is that there are millions of apps with millions of users and lots of data collected of all sorts of stripes. And I think people genuinely are surprised to discover just what an app is revealing about their particular location or their particular habits or their particular interests. The so-called patterns of life that these things uncover are hugely valuable to society, but also to the companies in uh, our economy. Presumably also there are issues about the sort of control over the software 
that the companies who produce it are exercising. I mean, for example, suppose some company becomes really good at creating some uh, computer assistant who who is so anthropomorphic that people naturally think of it as a, a trusted friend and advisor. That, there's a lot of potential power for controlling how people think, the decisions people make, influencing people in ways that they might not realise is being done. Look, I mean, this is the whole um, issue that we already feel uncomfortable with, with the way in which social media and automation of bots within social media sites that may or may not influence people's perceptions. So, yes, you're exactly right. There will be questions to ask about the, um, whether there will be, but there ought to be, self-limiting ordinances or various forms of review and oversight. Um, and I think that this is one of the challenges, that this isn't just about computer scientists building these devices. This is about a requirement to have a multitude of disciplines asking questions of the applicability and appropriateness and use. I'm a huge fan and advocate of AI. I mean, I've always uh, been passionate about the subject, but I do think we have to be mindful of the uh, moral and social challenges it'll present us back with. Yeah. Is this becoming more difficult or easier as time progresses? I mean, we know much more about AI. People are more familiar with these sorts of issues. On the other hand, in some ways, AI is becoming more inscrutable. Yes. There is a slight danger, I feel, that we were presented with this technology almost hieratically, as if it's being handed down from on high by these um, super companies uh, with um, a range of um, intellectual insights that no one else has. So that's quite important that we do find ways of plainly explaining um, how these systems in general terms work, and that we shouldn't be bamboozled by the complicated mathematical terms that are driving learning in these systems, that isn't what's at issue. It's, a, it, it's much more about the purposes, the limits, the expectations around how that technology will be used. And that's no different in computer science and AI than it was in the early days of chemistry and chemical warfare, for example, or biology and nuclear science. Right. Well, one significant difference, though, perhaps, is that with chemical warfare and so forth, the people that you need to influence are a relatively small number. Very few people are going to be in a position to dictate how those things are used or researched. With AI, you've got something that is potentially ubiquitous, that's being used by millions, billions of people in their daily life. To what extent are we going to have to put efforts into educating people, informing them, giving them some sort of real understanding of what these systems are doing, far more than they have at present. I think that's essential. It's not just about digital literacy. You know, People often talk that that's important in all of this, but it is about understanding the opportunities and challenges of the technology, what this is doing to their lives. And it isn't just about the AI, the algorithms. It's a lot about the data. And, and I think that building societies in which we're able to flourish as human beings in data-enabled societies, AI-enabled societies, will be one of the defining issues of our century. And there'll be variants of that. There'll be experiments in one jurisdiction that already are, you know, what is AI with Chinese characteristics? What does it look like on the West Coast of America? Will it be different within the European context? Where the presumption and assumptions about what we're happy to have organisations do with the information they garner about us, with their algorithms, with their AI, could look very different. These are extraordinarily complicated issues, aren't they? They're pulling in people from a very wide range of disciplines. Yeah, and I think that's why Oxford is such an interesting place to be uh, undertaking this kind of research. I mean, there's great AI throughout the world, great AI in the UK. But what's particularly interesting about Oxford is this very broad range of traditions that you can bring to bear from the law, from philosophy, from uh, consideration of the engineering and technical challenges, how it can be employed in a health context, how it might be used in an engineering context or in the context of making decisions about our social policy. This does require a plurality of views and expertise. Yeah, well, we, as you know, we've had a, a lot of different views on this podcast. Uh, you're actually our 28th <laughs> Oxford uh, visitor. 
to it. And uh, indeed, we've seen what a rich variety of different perspectives there are and how much work is going on to help us in this very interesting but rather unpredictable future. Artificial intelligence has tremendous potential to help in all sorts of areas, and we've heard about quite a few of those. I think we tend to anticipate things over the time scale of a normal human lifetime. You know, for us, 25 years is a long time, and if things have been more or less the same for 25 years, we find it very hard to adjust to the idea that things might change dramatically within the next five or ten years. With artificial intelligence, we might be at such a juncture. It's hard to predict these things, but when we have a lot of people who are very knowledgeable predicting that there's going to be very significant change just around the corner, we have to take that seriously. I think most people are so concerned at the moment about just the next year or two with more immediate worries. We're still facing austerity. The economy is not recovered. We've got all sorts of issues about Brexit, uh, lots of political instability around the world. There is no way that our economy in general is going to take large scale coordinated action to adjust to new possibilities from AI. So inevitably, it's going to happen piecemeal. There is a worry that the rate of change with AI is so fast that it's going to be impossible to adjust in time. There's going to be a lot of disruption. Even in the best case, it takes two or three years for people to re-educate, to take on new careers. But the sheer speed with which AI can propagate around the world means that if some industry finds that it can be more profitable by replacing humans with computers and robots, it's entirely possible for that to propagate within months rather than years. I can foresee a lot of disruption there, a lot of hardship on the way to making that adjustment. Even suppose we were able to harness the finance and the political will to take some really coordinated action here. It's not entirely clear what we should do. What are the new jobs going to be? What do people need to be able to do to prepare themselves for a new age of artificial intelligence and robots doing more? Superficially, you might think, oh, we should teach all our young people to program. That's probably a good thing to do anyway. It's good, it's good for their intellectual development. It's a very valuable skill. It's something that's likely to be increasingly useful in lots of different spheres. But it's not like you're going to have a high proportion of the population writing the software that runs the robots. So the fact that artificial intelligence becomes more and more ubiquitous doesn't actually mean that a far higher proportion of the population are going to be writing artificial intelligence algorithms. No, it just means that the successful artificial intelligence algorithms will be used far more widely. So a lot of the changes that are going to be made in the future, I think, are quite hard to predict. A lot of them may depend on social changes, on government decisions. You can see that there are all sorts of ways in which artificial intelligence could automate certain types of jobs and thus make it possible for more resources to be moved into quite different spheres. An example I gave in discussion of, of a couple of the podcasts was healthcare and elderly care where you can imagine that the increased wealth that comes from artificial intelligence could be put into giving far more support there. But it's not like the people who are going to be giving the support there are themselves going to be experts in artificial intelligence. No, they're going to be experts in looking after people. They're going to be you know, kind, empathetic people who can help our elderly people deal with the problems of age and health. And that's a million miles away from AI. So we may also have robotics playing a role there, but the opportunity for extra employment there, if it comes, will come from a distribution of resources rather than from the immediate impact of AI. And in that case, the question is going to depend on political decisions, not on technical developments. And that makes it even harder to predict.
Getting a balanced view of artificial intelligence, though, and getting a sensible political and educational perspective is quite difficult. One reason it's difficult is because there's so much hype about it. Some of that hype is deserved, but on the other hand, quite a lot of it is associated with sort of Terminator scenarios or the idea of superintelligence making humanity redundant. That sort of thing, I think, is not anything we need to worry about now or probably for a very long time. Far more immediate concerns about artificial intelligence involve its potential misuse. And here we, we really do have a tension. To get the maximum benefits out of artificial intelligence, we'd like lots of people to be developing it. We'd like it to be used and explored and experimented with in lots of domains. On the other hand, we already know that it can be misused. And artificial intelligence gives some people tremendous power to abuse the very media which enable it to be distributed so widely. We've seen that with political interference, with manipulation of people through targeted advertising and all that sort of thing. It's clear that we need some controls on those abuses. Getting the right balance, which will allow us the great possibilities and opportunities from AI, whilst at the same time keeping those risks to a manageable level, that is a very serious challenge, and I don't think it's a challenge we can yet claim to have solved. Putting my philosopher's hat on, I think a lot of the assumptions which govern our thinking both politically and morally are actually gleaned from the world as we experience it. So we tend to believe in absolute principles of right and wrong or freedom and democracy and so forth. But actually a lot of those principles, I believe, are contingent on the way the world actually happens to be. If the world changes radically, we have to be prepared to rethink some of those principles. Now, an example is the market economy, where it's generally assumed that people who develop new things should have intellectual property over those things, should be able to gain all the profit from that, taxed only at a modest rate, and they should be free to do more or less what they want with the money they get from it. That all works fine if you have a society where pretty much everybody who's able-bodied, if they are prepared to work, can make a decent living. If we end up in a situation where that's no longer the case, where a, a lot of people simply do not have skills that will make them economically valuable enough to be worth employing by those who've got the resources to employ them, then I think many of the assumptions that we take for granted are being undermined. We will have to rethink how we organise society. Again, that's not going to be easy, particularly when you've obviously got a lot of well-resourced vested interests who will be against any change. So I think we are entering a time where rethinking some of the assumptions behind our society, politically, economically and in other ways, may become increasingly important. And I'm not sure that we're very well placed to do that. We've seen a lot of polarisation recently. And I think it's becoming increasingly important for there to be some flexibility, some openness towards the possibility that artificial intelligence may change the world in a sufficiently fundamental way that we really have to rethink a lot of the assumptions underlying our society. Our final guest today is Azim Azar, host of the Exponential View podcast, where he discusses the future with some of the world's leading thinkers and practitioners. Earlier this week, he gave us his views on where AI is heading. If you believe that AI uh, is an important technology, then you will recognise the need to think about how it should be designed. Uh, and thinking about how it should be designed and what its purpose is, um, is fundamentally an, an ethical con consideration. And in a sense, if you don't think we should worry about the ethical considerations, then in a sense, you're also saying we shouldn't be worrying about the design of these things. And, and that's either very risky, uh, or it's a belief that they these things uh, sort of live in a space that is trivial. 
Um, so there is definitely, I think, a value in having those uh, discussions, the discussions of what kind of world we want to have, what does fair mean, uh, what are the correct procedures for justice or uh, explication or redress. Um, uh, and for too long, the technology uh, uh, market has, uh, as an industry, rather than sort of small t technology, general thoughtful, purposive innovation, but the technology industry uh, has been allowed to operate purely by the rules of the market. So essentially, we would say, listen, the market decides whatever decision the market comes to, you know, the customer is always right, that must be the right outcome. And, you know, there's any number of uh, unintended or horrible consequences, whether it is climate change or obesity epidemics and so on, which are connected to that level of thinking. Um, so this is a particular domain where, which came to uh, to exist really uh, in the 70s, around the same time that you had you know, Milton Friedman making claims about the purpose of the corporation, or at the time that you had this move towards a sort of supply side economic thinking, um, and a, a belief that you just needed to to deregulate uh, and let uh, you know the, the entrepreneur do their best. Um, and, and I don't think it's actually served us particularly well, to, to be honest. Um, I think the global financial crisis is ex evidence of that. I think the way in which the systems of accountability seem to be straining in lots of uh, developed uh, and rich countries uh, is evidence for that uh, as well. So yes, there's inherent value for these uh, in ethical discussions when we think about AI. I wouldn't say that the use of uh, ethical thinking, which I, I would put in the context of the design thinking, uh, is ever a restraint on a product uh, development. Uh, the purpose of a, of a technology really is to su serve a human purpose uh, and technologies that are sort of created without that in mind, uh, what the sort of metaphorically dirty bombs in a sense. So I would look at this as saying, do you want technologies to have a design intention behind them? And if you do, and I think we do, then creating different methodologies to figure out that design intention uh, is a sensible thing to do and one of those methodologies may be ethical thinking. I think there are a couple of ways of looking at the question of which industries uh, or types of work will be most affected. Uh, you could either look at them in terms of the, uh, the existing IT intensity um, or perhaps you could look at them at how easy or hard it is to uh, to use automation technologies. Put it this way, those sorts of industries which have already had a lot of technology investment in them, they had moved to the cloud, processes have been moved uh, digitally, uh, should be easier to apply our simplistic AI systems of the day to improve. And you could argue, well, there, therefore, things like uh, finance will um, improve really rapidly and be impacted very quickly. But you could also argue that places where we don't necessarily have a lot of technology investment uh, right now stand to gain the most, have the largest delta of their improvement if we start to use technology in them. And a one, a standouts would be things like, you know, very heavy logistics or construction, where effectively you say, uh, well, construction is, is running at a D level, a grade D, when we think about its level of IT sophistication. So getting it from a D to a B is much easier than getting banking, which is at an A from an A to an A star. Uh, I would say that we'll see a lot of innovation in the application of AI systems in places where we perhaps haven't had uh, traditionally um, a lot of you know, integrated, digitized processes, because those are places where, where the, the short-term wins are hard to come by, but the medium-term wins are significant. The second way, I suppose, of looking at this is also about the ease with which processes can be uh, automated. Uh, and, and often we talk about the automation of the truck driver uh, as an impact on that particular type of, of work. Um, but, but there are areas of work which are not in trucks and cars, uh, which probably lend themselves to um, much more routine uh, and much less interaction with the physical world. And those, those are areas where actually it's a lot easier to just automate and get a quick quick payback. And, and so I think there's an argument to say, well, threats to truck driver, drivers and taxi drivers, uh, sort of notwithstanding, the, there's a whole class of work that lends itself to 
to smarter tools um, uh, and, and sort of substantial replacement of key human tasks, uh, and that is the work that uh, occurs within offices. Thank you to Gil, Sandra, Nigel and Azim for their time this week, and also to you for listening to Series 1 of Future Makers. I'd also like to thank the team that support me in producing this show, especially Ben and Steve, but also Nathan, the Porters and the fantastic staff at Hartford College. I'd love to know what you thought of the whole series, so why not leave a review and let me know which episodes you enjoyed the most. Future Makers will be taking a short break now, but we'll be back with Series 2 in the new year, when we'll be taking on another of society's grand challenges, building a sustainable future. Before then, we'll also be publishing a number of special one-off episodes, including on quantum computing and the global opportunities and risks it could present. I'm Peter Millikan, and you've been listening to Future Makers. Hi there, I'm Emily Elias, host of the Oxford Sparks Big Questions podcast. And on our show, we are asking all the questions that you didn't know you wanted to ask. Like, can a machine pick the perfect Christmas gift? What can adult contemporary power ballads teach us about the sex lives of fruit flies? And should I take a selfie with a tiger? Go, press the buttons on your phone and subscribe to the Oxford Sparks Big Questions podcast now. That's the Oxford Sparks Big Questions podcast, available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and just about anywhere on the internet.